Good morning and happy holidays. On behalf of the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind, also known as MCB, its Region 3 team, and the Region's Regional Advisory Council, also known as the RAC, please accept my warm welcome to our 2021 virtual open house. For those of you who joined us last year, you may recall our theme, Resilience in the Disability Community During the 2020 Pandemic. This year, we will focus on Title III public accommodations under the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA. It is my hope that you will leave this open house better informed about the ADA, empowered, inspired, and roused with conversations to share with your family and friends over the holiday by what you observe and learn today from our dynamic key spe keynote speaker, distinguished panelists who are all subject matter experts in their own rights. On the topic of, topic of accessibility standards and the ADA, as well as powerful testimonies from individuals willing to share their experiences and or challenges on living with a disability or disabilities as it relates to Title III. Last year, you gave us some valuable feedback and we listened. This year's open house will be more engaging, allowing you, our audience, an opportunity to interact with our panelists and guest speaker. In addition, we have also provided you with an agenda. In summary, I dare you to embrace today's topic. I dare you to educate others on what you've learned and not to turn your head and become silent when you observe someone or something being violated under Title III of the ADA. However, I implore you to become part of the solution and not the problem. Do the right thing. Finally, I leave you with these impactful words. Knowledge is power and power is strength and strength is empowering. Once again, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the program. At this point, I'm gonna transition over to our moderator for this event, Mr. Jay Rufo. Um, Great, thank you very much, Thelma. Hello and welcome to MCB's second virtual open house in recognition of International Day of Persons with Disabilities and the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Thelma mentioned, I'm Jay Rufo. I'm director of the Metro West region here at MCB, and I'll be assisting to moderate today's events. While I've been an MCB staff member since 2009, today I'm taking off my director's cap and putting on my consumer's hat as I've been an MCB client with a visual disability for over 30 years. Over the past three decades, I have been privileged to be a part of the vibrant local and national disability community. And it's a true pleasure to welcome one and all to today's event. There are several accessibility features to be aware of throughout today's presentation. We have ASL interpreter services and CARTS real-time captioning services available for today's celebration. We ask that if you're not utilizing ASL interpreter services, that you please turn off your video unless you're speaking. Additionally, we ask presenters to please identify yourself when talking. The ASL interpreters with us today have the name interpreter on their video. Participants who wish to view the ASL interpreter should select the pin video option in the Zoom context menu, which is available by hovering over the interpreter's video thumbnail. To access CART real-time captioning today, you can select closed captioning on your screen, or you can use the stream text link provided in the chat feature. Here to provide further information about additional Zoom and accessibility features available throughout today's presentation, here's my co-moderator and yours, Director of MCB Communications, 
Carla Cat. Thank you so much, Jay, for the introduction. And thank you everyone for being here today for our second annual virtual open house. Um, we do have a great event um, like Jay and Thelma mentioned and want to thank our ASL interpreter team that is with us and that is spotlighted or spotlit on the camera um, with us today as well. Thank you so much, Sheila Burke and Lori Benjamin. And thank you as well to our CART provider, Tracy um, Ukura, I believe. Thank you so much. Um, and if you do need to utilize those services, please look for ASL interpreter in front of Sheila and Lori's names here in the participant list. And then also, if you would like to access CART services, the stream text link is in the chat provided for you. And then also it is available at the bottom of your Zoom screen by clicking on the captioning options. Um, we do ask, as Jay mentioned, to please keep yourself muted during today's event with your video off so that we can optimize the screen for our interpreters and presenters and for any participants utilizing interpreter services. The shortcuts for um, you to mute if you are joining via a phone are star six. And if you're joining via a Windows device, that's alt A to mute and unmute. And if you're joining via a Mac device, it is command shift A to mute and unmute. If you need any assistance today at all, we have three colleagues from MCB who are available um, and you can find them in the participant list, send them a chat at any time. That's MCB Zoom host, myself, Carla Kath, MCB Zoom host Samantha Linden and MCB Zoom host Camilla Dragos. And we will be on standby to assist. Thank you again. We are recording this event and hope to be able to share it with you following the presentations today. All right. And I believe with that, we have um, our first speaker here with us this morning. Commissioner David D'Argangelo is with us and he will be our first presenter today. Give you a little background on Commissioner D'Argangelo. Legally blind from a young age, David D'Argangelo has built a successful career in the public and private sectors. He now serves MCB as commissioner um, and is part of the Baker Polito administration. Additionally, he serves as a council member for the National Council on Disability which is an independent federal agency that plays a leading role in crafting disability policy and advising the president, Congress, and other federal agencies on programs and practices. As commissioner, David oversees MCB's $34 million budget to ensure the highest quality of VR and SR services for our community. Previously, Commissioner Dark Angelo served as the director of the Mass Office on Disability, MOD, and also served three terms as a Malden City Councilor at large. We are thankful to have Commissioner Dark Angelo with us today. He's a graduate of Suffolk University, where he served as an adjunct faculty member in the Communications and Journalism Department. And he lives in Malden with his wife, Lisa, and his daughter, Isabella, who is on the autism spectrum. Commissioner Dark Angelo, thank you for being here. Carla, thank you so much. Good morning to everybody. Welcome. Great crowd here, so excited to be here. Thank you for being here virtually with all of us from the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. Great job team, I'm looking forward to a great day today. It's David D'Archangelo, Commissioner for Max Commission for the Blind. It's terrific to be with you all here today to talk about some of the services we provide at MCB. Services that seek to empower individuals with disabilities and provide access to opportunities to work and thrive throughout our Commonwealth. Our mission at MCB is to service individuals in Massachusetts who are legally blind and deafblind by providing access to employment opportunities and social rehabilitation with the goal of increasing independence and self-determination. We believe in the values of perseverance, adaptability, respect, resilience, and inclusion. This is our second virtual open house for MCB, presented by our Region 3 Northeast Boston team. A special shout out to Thelma and your great team 
I appreciate you all. Uh, I also want to thank and recognize the Region 3 Re Regional Advisory Council. Thank you for all of your work. I'm so pleased that you're putting this together for our second year. Such a great program. This event is held today, December 3rd, in recognition of International Day of Persons with Disabilities as established by the United Nations. We're pleased to recognize it here in the Commonwealth. Also, 2021 marks the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA, which I'm very fond and familiar with, we'll be discussing that today and specifically Title III. As you may know, Title III of the ADA covers public accommodations and ensures that individuals with disabilities are provided with reasonable modifications, accommodations, and accessibility throughout places of public accommodation. This virtual open house provides another opportunity for our agency to continue to connect with our community partners, our consumers, and all the people we are honored to serve throughout the Commonwealth. You'll hear from many individuals today who will share the importance of the ADA as we all strive to ensure that people throughout our Commonwealth are working together to make Massachusetts more inclusive for people with disabilities. Thank you again to my team, all of our speakers and panelists and everybody who helped make today possible, and most especially all the consumers for joining today. Such a great crowd. I'm thankful to be here. And at this point, Jay, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Great, thank you very much. Thelma, would you like to introduce our first presenter? Absolutely. So welcome again. Uh, it is an honor for me to introduce Ms. Kayla Bentis, who is a member of um, our regional, regional Advisory Council. And I'll give you a little background information on uh, Kayla. Kayla is a resident of Peabody, and she's been a member of our Regional Advisory Council for over seven years. In 2017, at the age of 26, she established Kayla's Vision, Inc., a nonprofit 501c3 organization helping individual, helping visually impaired and blind students living in Massachusetts with funding to buy equipment, attend camps, and apply for grants and scholarships through her organization's fundraising efforts. Kayla has a bachelor's in business and management with a minor in entrepreneurship. Are you surprised? She is currently enrolled in Salem State University's Master of Science and Accounting program with an anticipated graduation date of 2022. Kayla is a graduate of MCB's nationally acclaimed summer internship program, where after successful completion, Secretary Francis Galvin's office hired her as a full-time employee in 2014, and she is still employed there. It is an honor for me to introduce to you, Ms. Kayla Bentis. Thank you, Salma. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is a very exciting event. Uh, Thalma and her team, as well as the RAC have been working endlessly for the past uh, two months, to, well, three months, uh, trying to get everything uh, set up and ready for today. Uh, so I am part of the RAC. Um, I was the former chairperson um, and stepped down for personal and work-related reasons, um, but I am a member. Um, we do a lot of different uh, things within the RAC. Um, and, you know, we're hoping that everybody has an awesome time today, uh, enjoying who we have for presenters. So enjoy and have an awesome day. Thank you, Kayla. That was Kayla Bentis, everybody, Veteran Advisory Council member to Region 3. To introduce our next distinguished guest, I'd like to welcome MCB Deputy Commissioner John Oliveira. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jay, and uh, welcome to all. 
Uh, Elizabeth uh, Denniston serves as Undersecretary for Human Services at the Massachusetts Executive Office of Health and Human Services, EOHHS. Prior to joining EOHHS in August of this year, she was Deputy Legal Counsel in Governor Charlie Baker's office. She also has previously held roles as Associate General Counsel in the Massachusetts Executive Office of Administration and Finance and Associate Counsel for the Massachusetts Senate Committee on Ways and Means. She earned a JD from Harvard Law School and a BA from Princeton University. Please join me in welcoming Undersecretary Elizabeth Denniston to EOHHS and the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind Open House. Undersecretary, over to you. Great, thank you so much, John, for that lovely introduction. Um, thank you, Commissioner D'Argangelo, for having me. I'm, I'm really grateful <clears throat> to be with you all today, recognizing International Day of People with Disabilities. Um, I'm relatively new to the role, and it's it's a privilege to be able to, to participate in events like this, to get to know the community um, and hear from you directly. I hope um, that these are in person soon so I can see you face-to-face. -face, um, and and um, so I, I look forward to a non-virtual event in the future. Um, I'm honored to be here to share my support for this community on behalf of myself, as well as Secretary Sutters. Um, your participation as members of MCB's advisory councils and boards helps us to ensure we hear from the community and are doing everything we can to serve individuals who are blind and visually impaired across the Commonwealth. <clears throat> I know there will be more discussion this morning about the ADA, but I wanted to acknowledge, as Commissioner D'Arcangelo highlighted, the 31st anniversary of this important law, um, which is critical in protecting rights, access, and opportunities for people with disabilities. Um, as you heard, my, ba my background is as a government attorney, um, and I've had the privilege to work on ADA cases, both in the governor's office, as well as when I was working for a federal judge in New York City. Um, I've seen firsthand what a powerful tool it is to ensure disability rights. Um, it strikes fear very rightly as a, uh, in, in the hearts of attorneys who are sued under that law. Um, and, and it's um, had an enormous impact in its 30 years and continues to do so. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm currently uh, eight and a half months pregnant and I'm grateful for the protections that it provides to me um, as well. So um, I wanna particularly thank everyone in this community for your collaboration with the state and MCB during these past really difficult 21 months. I think as we all saw, um, the pandemic in some ways increased access, but really laid bare other areas where it's necessary to work on improved communication and accessibility, like ensuring screen reader compatibility for websites as we work to keep everyone informed about the pandemic and vaccines. So thank you so much for your feedback. I know you've been very active and for your resilience as we navigated an incredibly challenging time. I hope everybody's taking care of themselves. Um, so I know the pandemic is gathered with you in this format um, and look forward to seeing you again in person in the future. Um, I hope today's open house is a reminder of just how strong the MCB community is. Um, the outstanding network of peers and providers who have worked so well together despite the many challenges of the pandemic. Thank you again for your commitment and your incredible work for the people you serve. I wish you all a happy and safe holiday season. Thank you so much. Under Secretary Denniston, we collectively thank you for your remarks and for the administration's valued commitment towards accessibility. Shifting gears now, we'd now like to thank or ask for collective audience participation. Throughout today's presentation, we have a number of fun facts about the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it's now time 
to test your knowledge with the first of two multiple choice ADA poll questions. Questions and accompanying answers are going to be displayed on the screen, and we'd like you to cast your vote through Zoom as to what you think the correct answer to the following question or questions will be. Before reading the questions, which I'll do in just a minute, I want to bring Carla Kath back on. Carla, are you with us? Hello, Jay. I am here and ready for the poll questions. All right. Are we ready to get this started? All right. Here's the question. The Title IV amendment to the ADA in 2008 set new standards in which of these categories? A, the workplace. B, local and state governments. C, telecommunications. Or D, housing. I'll read that question one more time. The amendment to the ADA in 2008 set new standards in which of these categories? Is it A, the workplace, B, local and state governments, C, telecommunications, or D, housing? And you can make your voting selection at any time. All right, Jay. It looks like everyone is participating and um, we have about 50% of our audience that have shared an answer to question number uh, one. And it looks like the winning question, uh, the winning answer is right now looking like C, telecommunication. Should we end the poll? I think we should end the poll, absolutely. Let's see All if right. everyone's right in the majority. All right, we have 45% of individuals who answered C, telecommunications, and a close runner-up was workplace. So, Carla, what's the correct answer? So, the correct answer is C, telecommunications. We have a smart group here today. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, everybody. It's fantastic. And I will read... Yeah, are you going to read a little bit about that answer for us, Jay? Please do. That'd be great. Okay. So from telephonic communications to the internet, television, and other digital services, it was apparent that Americans with disabilities needed special accommodations. Everyday tasks, such as surfing the web or watching television, range from inconvenient to impossible with hearing, vision, or other physical impairments. Title IV set new standards for telecommunications. Through it, certain requirements came into effect for digital communications, including closed captioning and guidelines for web accessibility. All right. Great. Okay. We have one more question for you in this segment, but as I mentioned, these will be peppered throughout today's presentation. So here comes the second poll question on the ADA. Government agency responsible for enforcement of the ADA is A, the Department of Justice, B, the Federal Communications Commission, C, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, D, the Department of Transportation, or E, all of the above. So one more time, the question is, the government agency responsible for enforcement of the ADA is the Department of Justice, which is A, B, the Federal Communications Commission, C, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, D, the Department of Transportation, or E, all of the above. Right. You can Thank you, Jay. Your answers. Yes. It looks like everyone is participating. I did want to make note that we actually, when we were building the poll, left off the Department of Justice um, <laughs> accidentally, um, but we do have it included in E, all of the above. So if you do include that, that does include the Department of Justice, if that is your answer. 
Uh, we'll we do have featured here, now. yes. We have the Department of Labor listed, the Federal Communications Commission, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and the Department of Transportation. Then E, all of the above, which seems to be the popular answer. Mm -hmm. There we go. All right. And we have um, more than 50%, almost 70% of our audience participating with 85% answering E, all of the above. Should we reveal the results, Jay? Let's go for it. Okay, the correct answer is E. So again, a very smart group with us today. Many, many federal agencies issue regulations, provide technical assistance, and enforce different sections of the ADA. Um, others include the Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So everyone plays a role. Um, good job, everybody. Great job. All right, thank you for your audience participation. More to come on poll questions later, but now we'd like to return to the presenters, and it's my pleasure to present today's keynote speaker, Julia O'Leary. Julia joined the Massachusetts Office on Disability as general counsel earlier this year. She has seven years of experience as an attorney with the executive branch, having served most recently as director of labor relations and deputy general counsel for the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Julia has a JD from the University of Wisconsin Law School and a BA in Sociology and French Studies from Smith College. Julia grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, where she first got involved with disability rights, working at nonprofits that advocated for inclusive housing and employment for people with disabilities. She's thrilled to continue her work on disability rights at MOD, and we're thrilled to have her here today. Julia, on behalf of everyone, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm so happy to be here with you today to celebrate the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. I've really enjoyed this morning's conference so far. I think it's a wonderful way to spend a Friday morning and really cap off the week. And I hope everyone has some fun plans lined up for the weekend to come. I know we're still in COVID times, but I bet that those plans involve visiting some type of public place, be it a shopping mall, a restaurant, a museum, concert venue, or even something more mundane like a laundromat. Now, to be able to enjoy these places, they need to be accessible to you. And that will mean a variety of things to different people, but the basic principle remains. You can't enjoy your weekend of holiday shopping if you can't access your local shopping mall. Which brings us to my topic for this morning, which is Title III of the ADA. It sounds dry, but really it's the cornerstone of accessibility in folks' day-to-day -day lives. The ADA, or the Americans with Disability Act, is federal legislation that was passed in 90, 1990 and was amended in 2008 that protects the rights of people with disabilities in employment, in state and local government services, in places of public accommodation, and in telecommunications. Title III of the ADA, which we're focusing on today, requires that public accommodations be accessible to people with disabilities. Now let's break that down. A public accommodation is any private facility that is made available to the public, like many of the locations I just described, restaurants, rideshare services, zoo, zoos, uh, gyms, hotels, uh, private educational institutions, basically any business that's open to the public. And the ADA requires that these businesses make their facilities accessible to people with disabilities. This may mean structural access, such as providing a ramp, or it may mean providing a reasonable accommodation or modification to the business's policies or practices to facilitate access, 
such as allowing a person with a disability to be accompanied by their service animal or providing audio descriptions during a movie or play. Let's talk about structural access first. To be able to enjoy the services of many businesses, you need to be able to enter and freely move about their facility or space. The ADA requires that newly constructed or altered public accommodations be physically accessible to people with disabilities. To help businesses comply with this requirement, the Federal Access Board has issued design standards called the 2010 ADA Design Standards that describe exactly what a business needs to do to be, to be able to be physically accessible. This covers everything from the slope of ramps to the height of tables and the design of bathroom stalls. In Massachusetts, we also have the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board, which has similar regulations to the ADA design standards. Businesses are required to follow whichever standards are more stringent in a given area. Now, it's important to keep in mind that these standards apply when a business renovates or builds a new space. The ADA doesn't require businesses to fix non-compliant features unless they're undertaking a renovation or new construction. So if you encounter a business in your day-to-day -day life that doesn't comply with the ADA design standards, it's likely that they haven't been renovated in the last 30 years or so. Um, some historic buildings are also exempt from ADA design standards, but if a business isn't physically accessible to people with disabilities, they need to have an alternate way uh, that a person with a disability can access their goods or services. So for example, if a coffee shop's building is not accessible to a person who uses a wheelchair, uh, that coffee shop should have a procedure for having a barista take the person's order and deliver the order uh, at an accessible location. Even if you can physically access a business's facilities, you may need other accommodations in order to fully enjoy the services that the business offers. So for example, if you need dressing assistance because, you're dis because of your disability and a clothing store has a one person per dressing room policy, you may need a modification to that policy in order to be able to bring a companion into the dressing room room with you to assist you with trying on clothes. Now the store wouldn't need to provide a staff person to provide that dressing assistance uh, if they weren't providing that, that dressing assistance service to all customers, but they would need to let you bring a companion in and modify that policy, uh, that one person per dressing room policy. Um, another example of a reasonable modification would be a restaurant providing a large print menu to a person with low vision, or if a large print menu isn't available, maybe providing a reader to read the menu aloud to the person. A person who is blind or low vision may also ask for um, audio descriptions at theater events or movies. Um, Another example, recently I heard about a woman who was deaf who tried to order a coffee at a Dunkin' Donuts and was asked to leave when the staff person became frustrated at not being able to effectively communicate with the woman. A solution that the staff person should have used was offering to communicate by written notes instead of requiring the interaction to be verbal and refusing to serve the customer. The bottom line here is that there are a variety of ways for businesses to accommodate folks' needs, many of these which cost nothing. Um, and businesses are required to engage in an interactive dialogue with people with disabilities in order to arrive at an appropriate solution. I want to take a minute uh, to talk about service animals specifically and Title III of the ADA. When I took an informal poll of my colleagues at MOD about what Title III issues they were most frequently encountering, the overwhelming response was denial of access to people with service animals. Keep in mind that a service animal has a very specific definition. A service animal is a dog or in certain circumstances, a miniature horse 
who is trained to perform a specific task for a person with a disability. A task is a specific action that the dog is trained to perform to assist a person with a disability. This can take a range of forms. For example, the dog could be trained to provide navigational assistance to a person um, who is blind or low vision. A dog could be trained to turn on lights or retrieve items for a person with a mobility disability or a dog could be trained to alert a person who is diabetic that their blood sugar is high or low. Uh, these tasks are really um, almost endless, um, but they have to be a discrete task. Um, and that's what makes a service animal different from an emotional support animal. An emotional support animal can be any kind of animal, and it isn't trained to perform a specific task but instead provides comfort or emotional support to the person with a disability. Under Title III of the ADA, businesses must allow people with disabilities to be accompanied by their service animals, but they're not required to allow someone to bring their emotional support animal with them. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion um, stems from, is this distinction between service animal and emotional support animals. Now, service animals do not have to wear a specific vest, a collar, identifying them as a service animal. And it, if it is not clear to a business owner that an animal is a service animal, they can only ask two questions. First, the first question they can ask is, is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? The second question is, what work or task has that dog been trained to perform? And those are the only two questions that the business can ask. They can't ask uh, for documentation for the dog. They can't ask that the dog demonstrate its task. They cannot ask the person uh, the nature of their disability. Um, and I wanna note that in Massachusetts, there is a state law that provides additional protection to people with service animals and actually provides a penalty of up to $300 for denying a person with a service animal access to a place of public accommodation. So it's really important that local businesses be aware of this requirement that they are required to allow service animals onto their premises. Um, the bottom line is that a business, be it a rideshare company, a restaurant, a doctor's office, must make reasonable modifications to their policies to allow the service animal. Um, and the goal of Title III is to ensure that people with disabilities can enjoy the benefits that businesses have to offer. Um, one thing that doesn't get discussed a lot is the benefit that the ADA provides to businesses by ensuring that they have more customers who can access their goods and services. 11.5% of adults in Massachusetts have disabilities. That is an enormous buying power. And businesses that are not accessible to people with disabilities are risk, risk losing over 10% of their potential customers. So if you take nothing else from what I say today, I hope it's best, the ADA doesn't provide unlimited protections, but it does require that businesses provide accommodations to make their goods and services available to people with disabilities. But you, as a consumer, have power beyond the law and beyond the ADA, which is your buying power. And you can use this buying power to let businesses know that it's important to you as a customer that they provide access to people with disabilities. I hope that all of you have a weekend where you can fully enjoy the diversity of goods and services that our local businesses have to offer and that those businesses in turn provide you with the accommodations that you need to be able to access their services. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was Julia O'Leary from MOD. A lot of great information about Title III of the Americans with Disabilities.
Moving forward and continuing on the theme of accessibility, we have two individuals from our community that are going to provide accessibility testimonials, Ursula Santoni and Brenda Clark. Ursula, Ms. Santoni, we'd like to start with you. Um, I'm going to read a question, and if you could respond to the question and tell your accessibility story, we would be grateful. And also remember to introduce yourself as well. Here's the question. Please briefly describe a challenging experience where you were unable to access a public building, restaurant, social venue, or use public transportation. Were you able to resolve the issue? If so, how? Tony, the floor is yours. Oh, I believe um, you are muted. Just a moment here, Jay. This is Carla. Here we go. Good morning. My name is Ursula Santone, and I am legally blind. Um, I've had this disability for probably 15 years, but it's gotten worse in the past two to three years. So now I'm legally blind. Um, do I tell my story? Mm -hmm. um, I, had, I was going to the post office in Malden and I had a bag full of um, items that I was shipping to my brother because I didn't have a box. And so I walked to, the, to these places all the time. So I went into the post office and when it was my turn, I asked for some help in picking a box that would fit the items that I had in my bag. And the guy just pointed, there are the boxes. Well, there were tons of boxes. I muted. And I said, I just need some help. Can you just help me? And he just moved me aside and said, wait over there, nobody came. Um, I tried over and over again to ask for help again. Please, somebody help me and nobody did. I finally asked for the manager. And the manager said, well, I told him what was going on. And I, he said, will somebody help this woman? And he left and went back into his office and nobody came. I waited and waited a long time. I was getting very frustrated because nothing, there was a line and I was embarrassed that I needed help. Sorry. Until finally, this guy behind the counter comes over when I started to yell. And he came and he said, what's your problem? I said, I can't find a box. I can't find a box that will fit these items. So he picks out a box and I said, well, can I have some tape? He said, it's on the box. Well, I can't see clear tape on a, on a box. So I asked him, where's, where's the tape? It's on the box. Can you show me? And he pointed to it. That I saw it then. So I put the items in the box. I sealed it up. Now I need help with an address because I can't write an address. And uh, again, I got back in line. And when it was my turn, I said to the guy at the at the front, I said, can you help me? I gave him the address that it was going to. Can you please print this out for me on the box? And he goes, well, just go over there and, and print it yourself. I'm like, well, that's the problem. I can't. Well, get back in line and I'll help you later. Well, later never came until I finally lost it. And some, <laughs> I finally lost it because I was just so embarrassed to keep going back to the end of the line and having to wait until finally this guy who was behind me said, what do you need? And I told him what I needed. And he just took me to the desk and he wrote the address for me, both addresses, mine and, and my brother's. And, um, and then I, and then I went back and just paid my fee and left and I cried all the way home. I was so embarrassed and disappointed that people would do this. And also that there were people where the post office is. I found out that there are people with elderly housing right near the post office. And what about those people that come in and ask for help and can't get help? How many of those have been rejected? 
And this is why I'm here. It's not because of me. It's not for me. It's for everybody else. And somebody's got to hear this story. And I, when I got home, I finally called uh, the uh, post office general's office and gave them my, my story. And she was appalled. And um, she said she would contact me again, and she never did. And um, so I called Donna and I told her my story. And, and it, it, it went viral at that point because Mefford's post office came, called me to give me my condolences or whatever, and asked what the story was and who helped me. And she said she was gonna take it up to a higher person than her and him, the other manager. And I never heard anything until finally I called, I called the post office. I actually, sorry, I actually went there in person because I had the receipt and I had a, a case number. And so I asked to speak to the manager and the manager came out and I told him my story. And I said, this is, this is the, the number that, they, that the post office general gave me as a case number. He looked it up and he goes, well, what do you want me to do with this? I said, well, they told me that I could be reimbursed for the fee of the item that never got there like 12 days later and I paid for two day shipping and also for the items that were thrown out out of the box because they weren't delivered in time. And he goes, well, I don't know about that. And he, he went in his office, he checked the number, he goes, yeah, I, I, I see that you have a complaint in here. Let me get back to you. He got back to me a couple of days later and said, I'm just telling you, I, don't, I haven't forgotten about you, but I'm working on it. And that was two weeks ago. And he hasn't contacted me. But when I come back next week, I'm going to make another visit because this, can, this has got to stop. People cannot treat people with disability like they were crap. That's my story. Thank you. Thank you so um, much, Ursula. That was so powerful. This is Carla Kath, and we just want to thank you for taking the time to share your story. Um, it's stories like these that help us to highlight the importance of advocacy and speaking out and working together um, to do all that we can for to build a more inclusive world, really, for all people with disabilities. Um, so thank you so much. We appreciate you being here today. Um, and I know we, we have another speaker too um, with us Absolutely. to share their story. So thank you again, Ursula. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, Ursula. There's a lot of strength in numbers uh, in terms of people out there that have experienced similar things. So we thank you for that. Carla, can you hear me still? Yes, we can hear you, Jay. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So our next accessibility testimonial comes from Brenda Clark. Brenda, I'm going to reread the same question, and if you could respond to it and introduce yourself upon the conclusion, that would be great. So the question again is, please briefly describe a challenging experience where you were unable to access a public building, restaurant, social venue, or use public transportation. How were you able to resolve the situation and how? Once again, Ms. Clark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Thelma for inviting me to speak and thank you all also for being here and, and listening. I. Um, I have a disability. I have polio. I use a wheelchair. I am a African American woman, um, and I have done a lot of advocacy in my days. I've worked for Mass Rehab for a number of years. I am retired, um, and I enjoy going out and trying to make things better for myself and others in the city. And in the and in the state, um, my experience was one day this past summer was a very very hot day. A very good friend of mine and I were walking down um, Commonwealth Ave, I believe it was. Yes, Commonwealth Ave, and um, we wanted to 
go to a restaurant just to get something to eat and something cold to drink. And um, we walked and walked and we finally came upon this place that we had looked up on, on our phone. Um, and um, it was a restaurant that you, when you come upon it, it they have an outside um, tables and chairs and things. And they also have a downstairs section. So we um, get there and we, we could see that there were like no places to sit on the um, street level. So we asked the manager, we asked the waitress, um, well, you know, what, what can be done? Um, and she said, well, really, um, if you'd like, you can, you can come down, down here. We have a downstairs section. I'm in a wheelchair. I'm not um, invisible. Um, you know, you can plainly see that I'm in, in a wheelchair. My friend who is legally blind, um, you, you knew that she was blind. She did have her, um, her cane. And um, she asked us if we wanted to go downstairs. And I kind of thought she was kidding, um, but she was kind of serious. Um, we said, we, we said to her, I said to her, well, I really don't think I can go down the stairs in this chair. And she then says, oh, okay, I, I see, I see. Uh, we asked for the manager because it was really um, like not embarrassing to just, it, it wasn't embarrassing to me, but I was angry. I was very angry, as was my friend. And, um, you know, we said to, the manager did come. We told the manager, you know, what the waitress said, which was really a, a kind of stupid thing on her part, inviting me to, I guess, roll down the steps. But, um, we um, we said to the manager, you know, you should have a section. You should have a table and a chair, some, you know, something here for individuals that cannot go down the stairs. You should have some accommodations here. And so he very quickly turned one of the tables that were not being used um, you know, they fixed it so that we could sit there. They accommodated us in that way. But it shouldn't have to go to that extent. If I come to your establishment, um, whether I'm alone or with someone else, if I need seating, it's one thing if you just don't have any seating at all. But to be so, I have to say ignorant, um, to be so ignorant to offer me a seat downstairs when I'm in a wheelchair. I mean, they need more training than, I don't know, I don't know that, I guess there needs to be a lot more uh, education to some of these establishments. Um, so in the, in the end, it was, um, you know, we did end up getting a, a table and we sat and ate and it was very good. So I was glad that we you know, made our point and um, let them know that they need to, you know, make some changes and um, be a lot more sensitive to individuals with disabilities. And that's my story. Thank you, Ms. Clark, for telling your story. I'm sure we can all relate to similar scenarios and situations in this community. Moving on, we are now going to hear from Sal Capadia with special remarks. Sal is the board president for the Lowell Association for the Blind. And to introduce Mr. Capadia, we now welcome the executive director of the Lowell Association for the Blind, Liz Cannon. Good morning, everybody, and uh, honored to be here. I'm actually honored to introduce Sal Capadia. 
he Sal came to Lowell Association for the Blind in the summer of 2012 as a freshman in the business administration major with a concentration in accounting. This evolved into a part-time job which lasted his entire four years at UMass Lowell and culminated in joining the board upon graduation. Sal currently serves as the president of the Lowell Association for the Blind Board of Directors. He's currently employed as the director, director of operational excellence at Micronics. Sal. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Elizabeth, for the uh, warm introduction. So I'll, I'll keep it brief. I know everyone has been uh, very, uh, very elaborate, so I'll try and catch us up, but uh, thank you, everyone. So the International Day of Persons with Disability is a United Nations Day that is celebrated every year on December 3rd. The day is about promoting the rights and well-being of persons with disabilities at every level of society and development, and to raise awareness of the situation of persons with disabilities in all aspects of political, social, economic, and cultural life. Thank you to Commissioner Dark Angelo and his staff for bringing us together on this day to hear from individuals and organizations in Massachusetts that are doing this important work. It has been a pleasure listening to all the program speakers. As the president of the Lowell Association for the Blind Board of Directors, we work with the blind and visually impaired of the Merrimack Valley, but realize the need of partnering with organizations that work on these issues across the state and nationally. It is through these important partnerships that we can all make a difference for the blind and all people with disabilities. Today's open agenda house, open house agenda reflects all aspects of International Day of Persons with Disabilities with all the panel discussions, personal testimonials and discussions of Americans with Disabilities Act, but also it recognizes the talents of people with songs and poetry. So I just want to say thank you to the planning committee for putting together such a wonderful program. Lab looks forward to continuing these important partnerships with MCB as we all work to improve the lives of people with disabilities in Massachusetts. Thank you once again. Thank you, Sal. We appreciate it. Thelma, moving on, I believe we have a musical selection. Yes, we do. It is an honor for me to introduce to some and present to others, Ms. Tina Luce. Tina was born and raised in a small rural community in upstate New York, blind from birth. She was educated in the public school system and encouraged by her parents, teachers, and friends to participate in most of the activities her sighted peers enjoyed. These included downhill skiing, horseback riding, swimming, hiking, and water skiing. After completing high school, Tina attended Westminster Choir College, graduating magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree in music education. She pursued her graduate studies at Leslie University, achieving a 4.0 grade point average and a master's of creative arts and therapy. She has worked as a middle school music teacher and currently serves as a minister of music, as well as volunteer work for hospice and the Lions Club. Tina has recorded several CDs, which can be enjoyed on such social media platforms as Pandora, Apple, Music, Spotify, and YouTube. I now present to you, Ms. Tina Luce. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Thelma and the members of the Regional Advisory Council for the kind invitation to share this song with you. It is a reminder that although we have been walking through times of fear and uncertainty, storm and stress, and the overwhelming grief and heartbreak felt by many who have lost loved ones during the pandemic, we can still hold our hearts open to love and watch in wonder as from the seedbed of obstacles and adversity, 
grow the roses of reconciliation, compassion, and healing. Let's press onward, keep singing, and allow this hard valley of trouble to become the path that leads us to the doorway of hope. Some say love, it is a river that drowns the tender reed. Some say love, it is a razor that leaves your soul to bleed. Some say love, it is a hunger, an endless aching need. I say love, it is a flower, and you, it's only seen. It's the heart afraid of breaking that never learns to dance. It's the dream afraid of waking that never takes the chance and it's the one who won't be taken who cannot seem to give and the soul afraid of dying that never Learns to live. When the night has been too long for me, and the road has been too long, and you think that love is all. Tina, that was outstanding. Tina's got talent. What? <laughs> Virtual applause for Tina. Great job. Uh, tremendous. So thank you again for everybody who's participating. Just shows what talent we have in our community. So now I'm so pleased to introduce our panel discussion and particularly the moderator of our panel, Mike Festa. Brief bio about Mike. Mike is the state director for AARP Massachusetts. He leads the development and delivery of AARP's community programs, advocacy, and information for more than 750,000 members across the Commonwealth, age 50 and older. Mike has a distinguished career in public service and knows our community well. He served in Governor Patrick's cabinet as Secretary of Elder Affairs from 2007 to 2009, he also previously served as state representative from my home district of Melrose and Malden from 
1999 to 2007, where he spearheaded the Equal Choice for Senior and Disabled Persons Law. He led successful efforts to increase state funding and federal funding for home care, long-term care, and elder protective services. He knows our community well through his previous role as president and CEO of the Carroll Center for the Blind in Newton from 2010 to 2012. And he first began his career as assistant district attorney in Middlesex County, has a long-standing law practice in his hometown of Melrose, served in Melrose government for 12 years with my dad uh, on the board of aldermen as an alderman at large and school committee man. He is my friend. He shows that Democrats and Republicans can get along for the benefit of everybody. And I'm so pleased to introduce Michael Festa. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thank you, David. That was uh, that was a pretty cool introduction. Um, I showed you, I gave you the bio, but I didn't expect the editorial comment, but it's certainly appreciated. Uh, and I also want to make a comment that uh, this program has been really inspiring to me personally, and I hope it has been to all of the attendees today. Uh, Tina, you know, talk about a, a great way to segue into what is, you know, really the, the critical question. We, we, we are approaching uh, an issue uh, about Title III, and in some respects that can get very technical and it can get very, you know, dry, but you suddenly just changed all of that with an extraordinarily inspiring song. And, and I want to thank you personally for that as well. Um, I also want to note that uh, we're going to have, I'm going to be introducing a panel of four folks. And in addition to the panel of four, we're going to bring back for a discussion and, and a conversation, uh, the keynote speaker, uh, Attorney O'Leary, Julia O'Leary, who uh, I duly noted is from Wisconsin. I'm assuming she's a cheesehead, a you know, Green Bay Packer fan. Uh, but hopefully since she's moved to uh, our area, she loves the New England Patriots as well. Uh, but with that said, I want to note that we've got some great panelists here, uh, and I want to just give you their names and a brief introduction. Peter Farkas. Peter has been the executive director of the Mass Hired Greater Lowell Workforce Board since 2017. He has over 15 years of workforce development experience designing and implementing workforce, workforce development programs. He's joined by Mary Mahon, uh, Mahon McCauley. She's currently the executive director of the Massachusetts Office on Disability. She has 34 years of experience working in the field of disabilities with previous positions at the Mass Rehab Commission. Rachel Tannenhaus, our third panelist. She is currently an ADA coordinator and the executive director of the Cambridge Commission for Persons with Disabilities. She has over 20 years of experience providing technical assistance on the ADA. She, has a, she is a current member of the MCB Regional Advisory Council for Region 3. And joining the panel, our last panelist, Lisa Orgetis. Lisa is the Executive Director of the Disability Resource Center. She has over 25 years of experience as an accomplished human services management leader and has developed and implemented several quality non-for-profit service programs. And so with this group of four experts, as well as Julia O'Leary, uh, attorney and counsel and our keynote speaker, I wanted to just start this panel by having each of them briefly describe how your organization embraces individuals with disabilities who want access to your services, and also perhaps give a brief example. And then we're gonna plunge into a couple of questions that have been offered by uh, folks who are attending. So let's go right down the list. Actually, uh, this is for the panelists particularly. So let's start with Peter. Sure, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mike. So as Mike said, I'm Peter Farkas. I'm the executive director of the Mass Hire Greater Low Workforce Board. And I think it'd be helpful just to give a, a broad overview of the Mass Hire system. Uh, so in the Commonwealth, there are, uh, the mass hire system is uh, the public workforce development system to connect job seekers and businesses to employment. So in the, in the state, there are 16 workforce regions, uh, and in each region, there's at least one comprehensive one-stop career center. So again, I represent Greater Lowell, and our career center is down, in downtown Mer uh, Merrimack Street. Uh, there are at least, I think there are around 25 actually career centers in the Commonwealth. 
And in the Northeast, there's career centers in uh, Lowell. I represent Lowell, Lawrence, Salem. And then also there's one in uh, Woburn, which is, uh, you know, not technically I think in the Northeast region, but is close by. Uh, so the career centers are at universal access for anyone that's looking for on the job seeker side, anyone that's looking for assistance with employment. Uh, here in Lowell, if someone comes into our career center and self-discloses they have a disability, we do have a disability resource coordinator that will meet with that person one-on-one -on -one, um, and do career counseling. What is what is that particular person looking for? Is it assistance with a resume? Is it assistance with interviewing, uh, providing labor market information, uh, potentially uh, assistance to connecting that person with training? Um, upskilling, reskilling. So whatever that person's need is, it, they, we have a disability coordinator that would work one-on-one -on -one with that person to ensure they're on the right career pathway. Very good, Peter. Thank you. Excellent. Mary, to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, my name is Mary Mahan McCauley, and um, it's great to be here today. This program has been fabulous. Thank you very much, Thelma Williams and Commissioner Doc Angelo for hosting this, and I appreciate being asked to be on the panel. Um, I am a white woman in my later middle age, probably more like early older age, but I like the later middle age thing better. <laughs> um, I wear dark sunglasses, I'm legally blind, and I have a cranberry sweater and reddish earrings. Um, I have worked, as was stated, with the Massachusetts Office on Disability as the executive director since 2019. Prior to that, I had worked for 30 years at the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. So most of my career working in the field of disabilities has been concentrated on vocational rehabilitation, the world of work and employment, equal rights with employment and employment increasing, trying to increase the employment for people with disabilities. I've also been a long, long-term advocate in the field of disabilities. And I was the, the close friend that accompanied Brenda Clark to that outdoor restaurant that summer day. And I thought that was a great job, Brenda. And I, I appreciated also hearing the other testimony from Ursula since as a person that's blind, I could identify with so many things. So that's that's all for me for now. And um, back to you, Michael, thank you. That's great, Mary. And we'll return to all of the panelists, of course, collectively when we continue the discussion. But let me now go to Rachel. There, my name is Rachel Tannenhouse. Um, I'm a big old white woman with purple and blonde <laughs> hair. And uh, let's see, and I live in region three. So I'm on the region three rack. I live in Malden. Uh, but I am the ADA coordinator for the city of Cambridge. And uh, so what we do here in our organization, and I'm certain that many of the other um, ADA coordinators in other municipalities can say the same thing, is we answer a lot of questions from folks um, who may even not know exactly what law they're asking about. Sometimes they just know that something went very wrong. Um, and uh, so they contact us. We can tell them a little bit about what their rights are. We also do things from the other side. We are happy to work with businesses and organizations in our city that uh, want to know what their responsibilities are. And so we happily, we do site visits. We uh, answer questions. We, if somebody's applying for a variance for, for uh, the Mass Architectural Access Board, we'll work with them on whether or not that variance is a reasonable thing to ask. Um, but consumers in particular are welcome to, um, to call and email with questions about what their rights are in a situation. We're not a direct service organization, so we don't necessarily provide you know, pr direct advocacy services, but we're pretty good with information. And we're not shy, so we happily talk to people. Thank you, Rachel. That's great. And last uh, but not least, for sure, is uh, Lisa Orgetis. So, Lisa, tell us about your organization. Oh, good morning, everybody. I am Lisa Orgetis, the executive director for the Disability Resource Center, which is an organization that is considered what they call an independent living center. And there is an independent living center in every city and town in the country. So, what we do is we work with any person with any type of individual uh, disability at any age. So we span the lifespan. We do a lot of youth services transition. We do a lot with people who are seeking 
all different kinds of things, housing, transportation, benefits, uh, SSI, SSDI, all kinds of different things. And so they come to us and we are partnering with them. They are in charge of what they want to achieve. We're here to help them and support them in that process. We do an awful lot also with advocacy in the community. We work on a local and a state and a national level to um, move forward inclusion and accessibility. And we will also be you know, very involved in pieces of legislation and community advocacy. That's great. Thank you very much, Lisa. Okay, so we've got a pretty good sense of who the panel are and uh, the organizations they represent. Uh, what I did want to do is note that several of you are working in areas where you have to, by I think by definition, collaborate with others around the state. And it might be helpful, even though this is not one of the questions particularly, but as, a, as the moderator, it struck me as you were describing yourselves that you know, maybe, you know, you may only work in Cambridge, only quote, you know, focused on, on the city, but I imagine you work with colleagues across the state and can share um, information and support each other. And I'm just hopeful that perhaps you can give us a sense, each of you, uh, what the nature of that collaboration is, because I suspect a lot of folks who are listening today are saying, well, you know, I don't live in that region, but what do I do? Where do I go? What are the organizations I can go to if they haven't had that experience already? So could we just touch upon that for perhaps a minute each, and then we'll plunge into another question that's uh, before us. Why don't we start with you, Peter? Sure. So as I said in my introduction, the, the mass hire system is um, across the Commonwealth. So the, 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 way, the way it was designed was wherever you are um, physically located in the Commonwealth, you're nearby a one-stop career center. Uh, so like, as I said, locations in Lowell, Lawrence, uh, satellite office in Haverhill, uh, Woburn, Cambridge is a career center. So that's one way the system set up to make sure we are serving all individuals. Uh, I should mention as well on the, on the, the youth side, we are a pre-employment transition services uh, pre-ETS uh, vendor. So on the youth side and going out of the building, we are partnering with our local school districts uh, with our special ed departments to provide services to those 14 to 22 year olds that are current, currently enrolled in high school. So that again, same, same kind of with the, the adult services, work-based learning experiences, career exploration, job exploration, and helping them get set up for once um, they do leave this, the high school. That's great to know. Uh, okay, Mary, for you as well, you're in that state role too. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what, how's it work? Well, actually within Massachusetts Office on Disability, our MOD, um, we do cover the entire Commonwealth. And our primary mission is to really, as I like to say, try to equalize the playing field for individuals with disabilities in Massachusetts, whether they're residents, employees, or visitors so that anyone can participate in all services or programs or events within our state and have equal access. So we're a pretty small agency. There's only about 13 people in my agency, but we work closely with many of the municipalities across the state. And, and I like to speak up on the fact that you know, as we heard, there's mass hire offices everywhere, there's independent living centers, there's 10 across the state. There's, um, we at MOD oversee and assist with all of the ADA coordinators um, throughout the executive office for all of the different agencies. And municipalities have ADA coordinators and we also assist and help with the commissions on disability, which many of the cities and towns have across the state. So part of what I truly love about my role is the networking aspect and getting information out there, whether the cities or towns or state partners or other executive offices, so that we all know what's out there and who can help who with what. That's very encouraging. Good to know. Rachel, for you as a local focused person, uh, how do you do your collaboration? My job is all about collaboration and it's one of my favorite parts. Um, so we work very well with other cities and towns. Um, sometimes it seems in Massachusetts like there are 351 different fiefdoms, uh, but in fact, we do have diplomatic relations with each other. 
And um, so we do, we work with neighboring cities and towns. And sometimes we get calls from other cities and towns who want to know, you know, they, they want to bounce an idea off of us. Um, so also, just because someone doesn't live in Cambridge, sometimes they work in Cambridge or they come to Cambridge to oh, good point. like we have lots of we have lots of awesome restaurants and businesses and things like that. Universities. And people call, call here or they have family members who live here and they have questions um, based on that. So like just because you don't live here doesn't mean you've never been here. So we often, you know, we want this, we want Cambridge to be welcoming for everybody, whether or not they live here. Good to know. Lisa? So it's, again, we're all about collaboration. And part of that is we need to make sure we understand what's out there in the community for resources and other service agencies. So we do a lot of information referral for folks. So we do have a lot of collaborations with all different kinds of pieces of local government, other human service providers, uh, the big medical facilities, Leahy, the veterans. Uh, so there's a lot of collaboration going on. The other piece is we follow the no wrong door policy. So it's incumbent upon us that someone does come to us and maybe we're not what they're looking for that we can do a warm handoff so that they are in the place that they need to be. That's, you know, I'm so glad you ended with that because in a way that was why I was prompting the question. Um, it <laughs> seems to me that there are a lot of folks who are thinking that, you know, I've heard a lot of the organizations represented here and there are a lot of things that are happening across the state but who's the first what's the first call i make and how do i break into this bureaucracy mm -hmm. but what you're all saying in so many words is you can call any of you or you can call any city or town uh you certainly can reach out to julia and her agency and you're going to find that no wrong door you're going to get to the right place it may take a bit of uh, several calls not by you, but by others to connect you. And I think that's hopefully, frankly, very reassuring uh, for the folks who are needing these services, needing the advice and, and dealing with the challenges that we're talking about. Um, with I, that said, I, yes, can Peter. I jump in real quick in terms sure. of collaboration? I should have mentioned earlier during yeah. my remarks, uh, part of the, the services provided through the Career Center is partnerships that are either on site or we referral. So that's um, MRC, MCB, Department of Transitional Assistance, uh, Senior Community Employment Program. So it's, it's, if when someone comes into the, a, a mass hire career center, it's working with that person to make sure if they're potentially eligible for other services through our through our partnership that they, we make the appropriate referral as well. Good point, Julia. Let me bring you back in, and I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to have you in you know one minute or so explain when things come to you and your organization uh, as general counsel and in your team uh how things work Thanks, um, yeah. i think mary did a good overview of saying sort of our our reach um we are really collaborative here at mod and so we work with pretty much any kind of person who wants to come to our door, be it an individual with a disability, a business, a municipality, a state mm -hmm. agency. Um, we have folks who kind of are specialized in working with a, a range of different people who need technical assistance on understanding the ADA um, and other disability rights laws. So we you know, are really into collaboration here. And, and we work really closely with our municipal partners and with our other state partners to make yeah. sure that folks get connected to the right place. Good, excellent. All right, now let's talk specifically about one of the issues that is out there with regard to Title III. And we haven't really talked yet about public school buildings. Now, there are many people I suspect who are listening in today who are themselves as students or they have children or grandchildren, and there may be issues that have come up with regard to accessibility of, of public school buildings. And we think about Boston and how many older uh, public schools there are that don't have, at least appear not to have, uh, the kind of accessibility uh, opportunities that you would want. Uh, what's happening there? What, as a panel, I, perhaps you can raise your hand as to whether you'd like to plunge in and make comment about that specific situation with regard to public school buildings, access, and what you do about it. Who wants to start? Julia's got her hand up. Okay. Um, first, a uh, really good question. And because the question is about public school buildings, 
I just want to note that right. we're talking about Title II of the ADA because we're in the public space here. Um, okay, Title good point. Three is for private businesses, so that would include private schools, any kind of private school daycare, but Title II covers any public entities. Um, Title II does have the same sort of physical access requirements mm -hmm. that Title III does, so the ADA um, design standards do apply to public schools. Um, if but we're in that same territory that I've touched on a little bit in my keynote is that if a school hasn't undergone renovations or, you know, new construction, or if they have um, been able to apply for a variance, they may not be fully compliant with those ADA design standards. So I think if you are encountering a barrier at your public school, I would go to the um, to the public schools administration, go to the municipal ADA coordinator, and um, and municipalities can uh, sign up for uh, Mass Office on Disabilities municipal ADA improvement grants that they can use to make some of those structural changes. So um, just want to plug our grant program. Um, we're just issuing a uh, of our grants uh, in the next couple of weeks. And, and that's a great resource for towns to make that kind of physical infrastructure improvement. That's good to know. And be, I'm gonna to go to Rachel in a moment, but let's just finish that thought. Do you have a sense for with, especially with the new federal infrastructure bill that's now being pushed out and now we have the legislature finally coming to agreement on the, um, you know, that 5 billion plus of resources from the federal government. Will there be more monies available for municipalities to access those grants and make those kinds of improvements? Because let's face it, money has been a big barrier uh, to breaking down the physical barriers uh, of access. What's your sense of that? We haven't heard anything specific yet. I think it's still mm -hmm. pretty early days. Um, our municipal ADA grant program is a longstanding program and we have a couple million dollars every year that we give out. So, um, and we continue, we expect that that will continue um, and, and it would be great if it was expanded, but with, at the very least, we'll continue to give out about 2 million a year. Good, okay. Rachel, you had your virtual hand up. Yeah, so just two quick things. One is that with public schools, it also gets a little complicated because off the top of my head, I can think of at least, and I'm not an attorney, but I can think of at least, uh, three federal laws that apply to public schools and that doesn't even get into state ones. So the ADA is okay. one of them, ADA Title II is one of them. And so there may be inter, you know, interacting parts that are a little more complicated. But the other thing is that Title II requires that you look at a program in its entirety and look at its accessibility. And so it is possible, for example, that if there's like um, a school, uh, a public school on one street and another one on the next street over, and one of them is accessible and one of them isn't, then the programs, then if, if a student or teacher required uh, using a, an accessible building, they would be able to use the accessible, uh, the accessible building and it would not necessarily be a direct ADA violation if, they, if there were a program, if the program were available to them, not necessarily in every single building. That's a good clarification. Very, very helpful. All right. Let's go to another subject area, which I suspect a lot of folks are familiar with, and that's on rest uh, with public restaurants or private restaurants that are open to the public. Um, are there, is there a requirement that Braille uh, menus or other uh, accessible ways uh, of uh, being able to understand what and get the information from a menu? Um, is there a requirement under either ADA or Title III about that? And uh, who wants to take that yeah. answer? All right, Lisa, I'm going to go to Lisa first. And then Mary, are you going to, you, are you going to have your hand up now? Okay, I'm going yes. to queue you up number two. Lisa. So not really. I think that okay. we talked a little bit about this earlier in your remarks, in that you're not required to have these things, but they would be an opportunity for folks to do, you know, their best effort in being able to make sure that the person who's there has the opportunity to understand what their options are. Good point. Good point. Mary? So uh, just to add to that, that, that would be correct, that you wouldn't 
be required to have a braille menu or a large print menu necessarily for someone that was low vision or blind. Um, I would highly encourage to have a few copies of braille menus for braille readers and encourage large print menus and maybe a few. In, because the other possibility would be that a, um, a wait staff person, you know, if I go into a restaurant, which I do quite often as a person that is blind and I might sell it, you know, I'd like a salad and maybe with grilled chicken and what are my options? And, and then they'll go through some of the things on the menu. Um, I'm not a braille reader. So it's, you know, as Julia wonderfully put at the beginning and I, she's the general counsel at MOD, which has been clearly stated and we're lucky, we are very lucky to have her in that role. Um, it's, you know, we, the buying power of the disability community is lots of dollars and lots of cents. So is, if a restaurant in, is more open to accessibility, whether they're able to interact with an individual diner that possibly is deaf and wants to point at a meal option or is, is just kind of, you know, communicating in a different way or making sure that they have access to open area as far as traveling between tables and all of the built environment kind of restrictions for someone with with um, physical limitations or possible wheelchair users. You know, all of those things are going to increase the possibility and make it, a, you know, make the person with a disability able to attend um, or to be a customer, you know, at that restaurant. So it's all the, the access in creating the access can be done in different ways, but the, the law itself does state that the access has to be there. So you could possibly do it in different ways, but it needs to be done, which is, which is helpful to all of us with disabilities, because we also want to go to the theater and eat restaurants and movies and be able to know what's going on. You know, I'm going to go to Julia in a minute, but I've got to pick up on that. It makes sense for the dollars, right? I mean, I, I know from the ARP perspective, we always remind our friends uh, in the you know general public that the older generation, and I, I happily include myself, Mary, in your description earlier in this conversation, yes. Yes. Um, you know, the biggest part of the economy for discretionary expenditures are mm -hmm. people over 50. Sure. And so that buying power, that yeah. influence should mm -hmm. be acknowledged. Yeah. And uh, it does make sense. And yeah. sometimes this is about, frankly, not having awareness. And so right. it's up to us as consumers. It's mm -hmm. also us as advocates to call attention to that in a way which is thoughtful you know, it doesn't have to be confrontational always, oh, unless, of course, yeah. you put up with the stuff that we heard earlier today, which is so disheartening. But suffice to say, there's a lot of opportunity here um, right. and there's a lot of influence yes. in a positive mm -hmm. way that can be yes. brought to bear. Julia, uh, for you uh, to make that comment as well. Yeah, I just wanted to mm -hmm. piggyback on um, on your Mike and Mary's comments about how it makes, you know, dollar cents to, to make these accommodations small businesses, so we're talking very small businesses, 30 or fewer employees, can also get tax credits for um, either structural changes or communication improvements. So if a small business, there's any small business owners on today, and you're looking to make communication improvements, and that might be, you know, a braille printer for your menus, um, you can get a tax, a tax break for, from that on your federal tax. That's really, that's great to know. And again, it's a matter of getting the word out to those who have an earnest interest in doing that, but maybe just can't afford to do it, right? And so we've got to connect those dots as well. Um, Lisa, my, your uh, hand still up on this one or did you want to, okay, let me go to you then. I just wanted to add, uh, one of the services of DRC is that we do go out into restaurants and businesses and we do a survey of accessibility. And so we have the opportunity to give feedback where they might just make some small improvements or changes mm -hmm. or, you know, change how much the door, you know, weight is to open, where the uh, soap dishes are, the access, yeah. all of that. So um, we do kind of have done that as a piece of our advocacy. That's great to know. S another subject that has come up and we wanted to have the panel weigh in on is with respect to employers. Now, we know that employers are required to make reasonable accommodation. I'm sure most folks who are employed and are on this and listening in say they recognize that term. 
But the challenge that's been posed in the question I raised to you is, what happens when that employer isn't being responsive? What, what happens when there is a delay or, you know, frankly, a silence on this? And, and the question is, you know, what is, what's the employee to do? I mean, where do they have to just keep bothering the employer? Do they have to keep pressuring and, and, and reminding? Or are there places and people they can turn to outside of the employer uh, to get support and hopefully get the results that they're looking for. So let me throw that out to the panel and who uh, I'm going to look around in our Brady Bunch boxes <laughs> to see who wants to rate. Mary, do you want to say something other sure. than just laugh at my comment? Sure. Okay, no. Mary, you take the no, first I'd be glad to. That's your I'm thinking Bailey back to, to Brady Bunch. Um, yeah. So the... I'm, I'm sorry. I just got, got had a mind um, slippage there. Kind of. That's a, a bad moment. joke I made, and I got <laughs> you off. You. We're talking about employers. We're talking about yes. enforcement. Thank you. you okay. As far as I mean, having worked in vocational rehabilitation for so long, this was something that came up a lot. And this is actually more Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Oh, good point. Which is more employment related, and. Um, you know, all within the same law. But as far as is there a specific time frame? No, you know, and I think it makes sense. I mean, I've been, I'm an employee. I've been an employer as far as a hiring manager as well. And I think the most important thing is to make sure that individuals with disabilities that are requesting a reasonable accommodation know that they're being listened to, that it's, it doesn't take two, three weeks to get back and say, I got your email, that there's a, there's a quick response time and maybe it's, we're looking into this more, let's schedule an appointment because the interactive process and the communication between an ADA coordinator and a person with a disability looking for reasonable accommodation is the very important part of that. There needs to be this interactive discussion on what is going to work. And just to use a quick example, um, again, you know, as a person that's blind, if I requested that I wanted someone to work with me that could read written materials to me. The employer could say, well, Mary, that we, we really can't do that, but we can make sure that you have a JAWS, which is a speech synthesizer on your computer, and that you're able to use a scanner to scan information, which then also can be read aloud. So it's really looking at what are the options and discussing that. Um, if I requested, or if an individual that was deaf um, requested ASL for all large meetings, I would hope that the individual business or employer would make sure to have ASL interpreters with every meeting, but it's quite possible with some things that it might change time to time. So I think that the whole communication piece, like with anything, is, is the most critical. Good point. Rachel, you had your hand up. Why don't we bring it home with you on this question and then we'll do the wrap because we want to respect the agenda. Yeah, I, I mean, Mary said most of it. And I think the only thing I want to say is that if there are any employers out there, <clears throat> I know as a, as a supervisor, um, one of the things I ask everybody who comes, anybody who would come to work for me, whether or not they have a disability, I will say to them straight up beginning of the job, what can I, what do you need in order to be able to do this job as well and as comfortably as possible? And that is not a disability question, but right. you often get people disclosing right. in that situation. It doesn't stigmatize. And mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is there's this idea out there that only people with disabilities have needs. You have special needs. I never met anybody without them. <laughs> so like, Everybody has some needs. We're just the ones whose needs are considered burdensome or have like laws around them and stuff. So if you ask everybody, it makes it clear that you are open to meeting people's needs and to engaging in that dialogue. And that can also make people with disabilities feel um, and be inc included in ways that, you know, make it clear that everybody's got needs and right. you also meet the, the needs of people with disabilities. Well, I have to say, talk about bringing home a theme. Uh, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. You know, these are, we're talking about laws, but we're also talking about good business sense. We're yes. talking about 
you know, the morality of things, how we treat each other respectfully, not knowing and appreciating a, a particular disability or even any accommodation of any sense that you could think of. In the end, I think what we're hearing loud and clear is that there are a lot of allies out there, advocates, government agencies, folks in the community that are here to get to the right solution. And mm -hmm. I just want to say on behalf of, uh, you know, the group that put this together, MCB, that it's been a real honor for me to uh, listen to you panelists. Uh, but Julia, I can't leave without asking the question. Have you converted to being a Patriots fan at this point? I, I have, Mike, yes. Oh, excellent. All right, very good. Well, on that note, I turn it back to our friends at MCB. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you very much to the panelists for an outstanding discussion. Moving forward with today's agenda, we're going to be going into some more testimonials relating to accessibility. So we have two additional individuals that will be providing their testimony and their experiences, Elaine oh. Alfiero and George Kamara. Elaine, I'd like to start with you. I'm going to ask the question again that we've asked to others doing testimonials. So if you could introduce yourself at the conclusion of the question and then tell your story, that would be great. Here's the question. Please briefly describe a challenging experience where you were unable to access a public building, restaurant, a social venue, or use public transportation. Were you able to resolve the issue? And if so, how? Elaine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Elaine Ofiro, and I live in Methuen. I've been legally blind for over 30 years, um, and that in itself has been its own special journey. My story has to do with uh, obtaining access, uh, have, having access to a building. I live in a very congested area and found myself trying to cross a four lane road to get to a pharmacy. There was a blinking light, but every time I pressed the button, it wasn't working. So I started asking questions like, what, how, can, how can this be, be this way? What can I do? And I got in touch with uh, the Commission on Disabilities for Methuen. Um, and spoke to the head of that uh, organization and then was asked to make an appearance at a city council meeting. It was interesting. I got to the podium and a long time ago, someone said the best way to teach someone is to ask a question. So when I got to the podium, it was my turn to talk. I said, when was the last time you crossed the street with your eyes closed? And then I was quiet. I waited until everyone started to squirm. And then I told my story. Um, come to find out that the street that I was trying to cross was not a city street, it was a state street. So it had to be bumped. So which organization was next? Who did I have to speak to? Um, and in the in in behind the scenes and all of this was it was an election year and so everybody wanted to get involved in this um human interest story so um ultimately what happened was um that even the governor got involved um i ended up not uh, they ended up the state ended up installing an audible signal for me. Um, Grace Cummings, our favorite, favorite mobility instructor from the Mass Commission, came and taught me exactly how to cross the streets. Um, and it was a change from where I was crossing the road, um, but it was, uh, I learned how to do it, how to listen, and um, and get to that store that I wanted to get to. Um, and it was a happy thing. My tail was wagging. Um, and that 
inspired me um, and gave me at least the confidence so that later on, um, as I found myself in a similar situation on a different street, I was able to get in touch with the Commission of Dis on Disabilities from Methuen and they installed an audible light for me. So um, what it means is that I have access um, to stores and places um, that um, before were not so easy. Um, I feel and felt um, empowered in the process. Um, it was, people were wonderful. Um, I always say people are wonderful if you let them be, but um, clearly this, my experience here was different than Ursula's or other people. Um, and all I can say is we're all in this together. Um, if we're not part of the solution, we're part of the problem. Um, uh, as a result of that experience, I ended up joining the Commission on Disabilities here in Methuen and served for a few years. Um, and it's been, as I said, a great journey. Um, it's a lemons to lemonade kind of thing. And um, I always say to people, I can do almost anything. That's my story. <laughs> Very well said. Thank you so much for that, Elaine. Thank you. To pro provide our final sharing testimonial, we're now going to say hello to Mr. George Kamara. George, here's the question again. Please briefly describe a challenging experience where you were unable to access a public building, restaurant, social venue, or use public transportation. Were you able to resolve the issue? And if so, how? The floor is yours, sir. Hi, Jay. This is Carla. Um, we are just waiting for George to join here and um, to unmute audio, George, if possible. There you go. Not muted. You are. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you so much. Good morning, and thanks for the organizers of this program, International Day of the Persons with Disability. Um, it's so interesting to be part of this. Uh, I've been blind since 1991. I've lived with disability now 30 years, uh, 14 years in America and uh, the rest in Liberia. But uh, my story is that in Liberia, accessibility to public buildings, commercial places, or uh, restaurant or uh, transportation, public transportation is not really common. And in fact, people with disabilities are perceived to be beggars. So those in the urban areas rely mostly on friends or their children to do their daily tasks. And uh, those in the rural areas uh, they are usually kept at those to, you know, guide the house while the family goes out in the uh, farm and come back in the evening. And uh, when I came over to the United States of America, my first return to Liberia was in 2012. And I had a very wonderful, uh, interesting story. I went to the supermarket to buy a grocery and um, the security at the post stopped me from entering and uh, said what was my reason for going. Because it is perceived that every person with disability going in, uh, in the public building or restaurant, whatever, they are going to beg for handouts. And so I said I was not going to beg, but I was going to buy. And even as he let me in, when I reached in the supermarket, the, super, uh, the manager called him aloud and asked, why did he allow me to come in? And I turned to him that, and said to him that I was a buyer, not a beggar. And after my you know, transaction, I pointed out to him that their motive of you know, perceiving people with disabilities was wrong. And in fact, it was really abusive. And uh, 
Comparing to America, I must be thankful to Mass Commissioner for the Blind because since I came to the United States and I was referred to them, they have given me tremendous help in all my pathways. Um, intensive school, they are all supportive. Uh, but there is an area that remains uh, still to be resolved, and that's the area of employment. I was hired a year and I was you know, terminated without prior warning, verbal or rating. And, uh, you know, but uh, I want to express that my internships with uh, the Carroll Center for the Blind, Mass Commission for the Blind, the Multicultural Independent Living Center, or uh, Jimmy Kaplan before, uh, the Brooklyn Senior Center, and now the National Brave Press has been so incredible because uh, in there I found out that there is no uh, difference in disability. Visually impaired people are there. But where I was terminated, um, I found out that I was the only blind person. And then, you know, that I have caused my disability or either race or whatever and replaced by somebody of the liking of either the manager or whoever. But, uh, you know, in my webpage, my email webpage, I have written a slogan there that says, disability is never inability. And that is song I taught my students when I opened school for the blind in the refugee camp in Guinea. Disability is never inability. Disability is never inability. Disability is never inability. Disability is never inability. Let us learn to love one another. In the countries where we live, in the communities where we are, and from the families where we are born, we are rejected and denied our rights. But disability is never inability. Disability is never inability. Disability is never inability. Let us learn to love one another. I will never be the only disabled. You will never be the only disabled. And we will never be the only disabled. Send disability is either by birth, war, accident, or by illness. So disability is never inability. Disability is never inability. Disability is never inability. Let us learn to love one another. Thank you. That's my short story. What fantastic energy. Thank you so much, George. Somebody better sign you up for a record contract. <laughs> thank we you. appreciate it, sir, so much. Great. So thank you to George and Elaine and really to everybody who presented today. Greatly appreciated it and uh, certainly fantastic information. So Carla, are we ready for our last poll question of the day? We are ready, Jay. We will test the audience one more time. All right. Is everyone ready to test your knowledge? Here comes our final poll question. And as with the last questions, this one will appear on the screen and everyone will have a chance to lock in their answer. This is true or false. Are historic properties exempt from ADA building codes? True or false? One more time, are historic properties exempt from ADA building codes? True or false? Aye. Right. The results are being calculated, Jay. We have okay. about half of our audience has submitted their answer, uh, but just okay. a minute, they're still coming in here. Okay. Okay, it's everyone. Like it's like <laughs> listening to election returns. Let's see who's going to win. <laughs> I know. It's very exciting. All right. We have um, a, a kind of a clear, clear response here. So we have 67% of respondees saying false, Jay, and 30%, a little bit more than that, saying true. Um, so okay. with, with, for, without further ado, 
the correct answer, they, they are right again, smart audience, the correct answer is false. To the greatest extent possible, historic buildings must be as accessible as non-historic buildings. This might mean installing a ramp, creating accessible parking, adding grab bars in bathrooms, or modifying door hardware. So there you go. Excellent. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks to all. Good job to all. And uh, thanks for the information and clarifying that. So we're coming to the end of our presentation today. We have one more speaker to provide closing remarks. And at this particular time, I would like to welcome back Director of Region 3 at MCB, Thelma Williams, to provide and introduce our final closing remarks speaker. Thank you, Jay. I just want to ask the question to everyone, was I correct? Do you feel exhilarated? Do you feel empowered, inspired after this morning's uh, event? I do, and I just want to thank everyone. But at this time, I would like to present and again introduce to others uh, a good friend of mine and colleague, Elizabeth Cannon, for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Thelma. Thank you to everyone who has participated in this virtual open house. It has been a jam packed morning with information, discussion polls and songs. I would like to thank Commissioner Doc Angelo and his entire staff, especially Region 3 staff, because I know how hard they've worked on putting this together. Um, and especially uh, the Regional Director, Thelma Williams, who has worked tirelessly on this open house. As Helen Keller would say, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. As we've heard today about the so much progress has been made, but there is still much work to be done. So let's get back together again. Same time next year. <laughs> I think Region 3 staff probably just groaned. It's a little too soon for that. Okay, we'll, we'll, take, we'll, take, we'll take some time to think about it. But I want to wish you all, um, uh, thank you all for joining and wishing you all a very happy, healthy, holiday season and a happy 2022. Have a great day. Thank you all. Jay, I, I, I'm sorry. I did not introduce Elizabeth properly. So oh. if I may, I'd like to do that now. Elizabeth Cannon has been the executive director for 20 years at the Lowell Association for the Blind. She is a member of the Massachusetts Nonprofit Network Board of Directors and is currently the president of a nonprofit Alliance of Greater Lowell. She is also a very, very active member, and she's probably been around the longest of uh, Region 3's uh, Regional Advisory Council. Thank you for all you do, Elizabeth. Thank you, Thelma. Appreciate all your hard work on bringing this um, event to fruition. Thank you so much. I just too want to jump in at the end here. Thank Thelma, Elizabeth, all the panelists, everybody who participated. Such a great event. Thank you all so much. Thelma, back to you. Thank you, David. And thank you for being here with us this morning. And thank you for your leadership. Um, we did it, folks. It's 11.59. That's fantastic. Thank you to everybody. And has been stated before, a very happy holiday season to everyone. And we might see you next year at this time. <laughs> Thank you. Jay, I don't know if you want to have this, anything else to say. Well, I just wanted to say I think everybody did a great job today. We'd like to thank you, Thelma, and the entire Region 3 team. We know putting on an event like this is always challenging and time-consuming, but as always, Region 3 comes through with great presentations. So goodbye to all from me, and thank you to Region 3. Thank you for being a great moderator. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>